All right, everyone, welcome to the Cali PA. We're going to start our research seminar here. Sorry to interrupt anybody talking. Right? Please have our seats when we get started. But before we get started in the research seminar, I'd like to have, go over some housekeeping issues. In case of an emergency, please go out the exits here, highlighted here and here, and down the stairs to the lobby out across the street to Cesar Savas Park. If you need to use the restroom, please exit the door here, head left, and down the hallway, you can find the restrooms. All right, and uh, those are just the basics, and we'll get started here. Melanie? Is this working? Yeah. Stuff. There we go. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to today's seminar. My name is Melanie Zauscher and I'm a staff at the research division here at the California Air Resources Board. The contract manager for this study, it gives me great pleasure to host today's uh, very relevant and interesting seminar. Thank you all for joining us in person and online. For those of you online, uh, you can email your questions at the address you see on your screen, and we encourage you to do so earlier rather than later. Before we get started with the presentation, please turn off your cell phones or silence the slam. Thank you. Uh, but really what I wanted to say is before the presentation, I'd like to provide some context. This study is an important component of our broader low carbon transportation research, which supports our efforts to reduce transportation emissions to help meet California's climate and air quality goals, create healthier communities, and work towards equality and access to clean transportation. For more information on other research projects in this area, please visit our low carbon transportation research website. As most of you probably know, California has set a goal of having 1.5 million zero emission vehicles by 2025 and 5 million by 2030 in order to help meet our climate and our quality goals. With the passage of Senate Bill 350 in 2015, the state has also set a goal of improving access to clean transportation to all Californians regardless of their income or zip code. In response to Senate Bill 350, CARB performed a study and wrote a guidance document focused on overcoming barriers to clean transportation access for low-income residents. Two of the main recommendations of the report were to expand assessments of low-income resident clean transportation and mobility needs and expand, expand funding and financing opportunities for clean transportation and mobility projects. Since 2010, California has provided consumers with rebates for new plug-in electric and fuel cell vehicles through the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project. Starting in 2016, this program provides incentives, higher incentives to lower income consumers. In 2015, the state began offering, sorry, the state began an equity program that offers incentives to scrap a highly polluting vehicle and replace it with a clean vehicle within disadvantaged communities. The replacement vehicles can be a used or new conventional hybrid plug-in electric or fuel cell vehicle. This program was originally called the Enhanced Fleet Modernization Program Plus Up and has been renamed Clean Cars for All. The program began in two our districts and is being expanded into more. The Clean Vehicle Assistance Program or Financing Assistance for Lower Income Consumer Pilot Project, mouthful, uh, helps provide lower income California, helps lower income Californians overcome the barrier of obtaining financing for new and used clean vehicles by providing low interest loans and vehicle price buy downs to consumers. The program began in 2016 and has been expanding us and was extended statewide last year. Because of all these programs, we wanted to examine how to best incentivize lower income consumers to purchase and obtain these vehicles. This study informs CARB's transportation equity incentive programs as well as the follow up to Senate Bill 350 report. Specifically, the researchers performed a vehicle choice experiment to determine the impact of different incentive types and purchase incentive amounts on the uptake of clean vehicles by these lower income Californians. The researchers learned about the number and types of vehicles, typical distances driven, and the amount spent to purchase, operate, and maintain these vehicles in lower income households. In addition, they learned about barriers to clean transportation access in this population. 
Due to time restraints, some interesting findings from this report will not be presented today. But you can find the full report on our website, um, which has been posted. Um, today's seminar is titled Designing Light Duty Incentives for Low and Moderate Income Households. The principal investigator for the study is Dr. J.R. DeShazo. He directs the Luskin Center for Innovation at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. DeShazo also chairs the Department of Public Policy in the Luskin School of Public Affairs. He is a leading expert on the design and evaluation of climate and air pollution control policies, the electrification of the transportation sector, as well as clean energy procurement and efficiency programs. You will note he is not here today. His airplane was diverted due to fog this morning. Today's presenter will be Dr. Greg Pierce, the Associate Director of Research at the UCLA Luskin Center for Innovation. He is also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Urban Planning. Specializing in transportation and water as a basic resource, Dr. Pierce's research focuses on disadvantaged populations and takes place at the household, metropolitan, and state levels. I'd like to sincerely thank the whole team for their efforts on this project and in ensuring that this research was aligned with CARB's needs. While we transition, here are some links where you can find out more information about the projects mentioned. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Pierce, who will get us started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, if you came for try my best to fill in. Um, again, my name is Greg Pierce. I'm the Associate Director of Research. Uh, worked on this research with JR, as well as I should acknowledge up front um, other co PIs, Dr. Evelyn Blumenberg, Dr. Paul Ong, as well as um, Dr. Tamara Sheldon and Britta McComber, all contributed to this research. Again, this is an overview of the report, which is 100. So it's high level uh, research findings. I'm happy to talk um, in more detail about any questions you have. Are we doing question and answer dynamically? Oh, okay, at the end. Okay. So I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions you have at the end, as well as on the report, et cetera. Um, the motivation for the study um, is really multifold, um, but really, I mean, the primary motivation is understanding uh, how we can, uh, the state can help overcome barriers that low and moderate income households have uh, for transportation access that both helps them get around, uh, meets their transportation needs, and also mitigates the environmental impacts of um, some modes of transportation. Really, the focus of this presentation and the research um, was based on a survey that was conducted, as I'll go into detail on, of low and moderate income Californians um, to understand um, both their current vehicle holdings, um, their current travel patterns and sort of transportation needs, um, as well as, in, in particular, um, their vehicle purchase decision making and financing, and then how um, both existing uh, incentive programs and potentially types of incentive programs and levels, um, both rebates as well as um, preferential financing, could impact uh, this population's uptake of clean vehicles. Um, a little bit about the survey that we conducted. Uh, the final survey size or, or final sample was 1,604 respondents from unique households um, throughout the state of California. Um, the final survey was conducted in summer 2018 um, via an on, uh, via, uh, or online via the survey firm GFK um, after, I should say, extensive uh, structured interviews as well as pre-testing of the survey over a six to nine month period. Um, the, the goal of the survey or the population um, had a few uh, parameters. Um, in particular, as I've said, um, everyone who participated in the survey had an income below 300% of the federal poverty level. And um, actually, I think half the survey um, had an income below, there was a, a restriction that half respondents uh, had an income below 225% of the federal poverty level. Um, for your reference, off the top of my head, um, the federal, uh, a household of four uh, at the federal poverty level will be making about $72,000. Um, Another restriction um, to participate in the survey for households was that they had to intend to replace uh, one of their current vehicles within the next three years. We were targeting people who were, um, had a current vehicle 
and uh, we're interested in replacing it uh, because we're interested in the effect of incentives uh, on the vehicle choice in the future. Um, there's a lot of technicalities, of course, in survey design to make sure that surveys are representative of a population, um, but the survey was designed and, and weighting was used to allow the sample, the final sample that we got, to be representative of the low and moderate income population or the, the population under 300% of the federal poverty level um, in California and to be representative of both English and Spanish speakers, but uh, among English and Spanish speakers. Okay. And this map is just showing you um, where the respondents were from throughout the state. Um, I was to say they were from throughout the state. Um, and, um, and we can show, there's a lot more we could say about sort of general validity of the sample or how the sample um, is representative of this population. But just to show you one comparison we made between our respondents or our survey, which is the far left-hand column, and other administrative sources on what the low to moderate income population looks like in California. Um, this slide is showing you um, that we nearly matched uh, the proportion of both non-Hispanic white and Hispanic respondents in the low to moderate income population, whereas we slightly oversampled um, for African American respondents and Asian respondents um, in this population. But we also checked uh, our population characteristics uh, uh, against other uh, travel and transportation surveys that are um, uh, California, particularly the California Household Travel Survey, and found that uh, in terms of vehicle holdings and uh, travel demand, um, our population was very similar. If you don't listen to anything else, uh, the rest of the, this presentation, here's a summary of the results, a, a hyper summary, and then we're going to go to a longer summary. Again, in the report, the, all the details are there. Uh, but a summary of results break into, broken down into three different categories. Um, first, um, around what types and how many vehicles um, and how, uh, how much is spent on vehicles among this population. We found essentially that uh, low to moderate income population in California owns as many vehicles on average 2.0 or 2 as higher income households. I think higher income households in California, if you look at other administrative sources, own 2.1 vehicles, perhaps. So it's very similar in terms of vehicle holdings. Uh, we also found that these households, the households that we surveyed, spent a very significant proportion of their annual reported income. Um, on their last vehicle purchase, they were actually reported spending over 50% on average um, for their last vehicle purchase uh, as a percentage of their income and um, reported spending um, over 10% of their income on the operation of their main vehicle. Um, so these households were spending a lot, clearly um, had a great preference for um, retaining, maintaining vehicles, even though it cost them a lot of money. Um, at the same time, the people we talked to, the respondents, or the people who were surveyed, um, expressed that they were largely uninterested in transit or other alternative modes. Um, we'll get into these results in more detail as we go. Um, but despite, again, this high level of money, high level of expenditures they had on their vehicles, maintaining their vehicle fleet, only 6%, for instance, reported that they rode transit daily. I believe 58% said they never rode transit at all. Um, and then finally, uh, in terms of vehicle holdings, around 40% said that they were willing to scrap um, their vehicle or trade in or scrap their vehicle um, for $1,500 or less. Um, which is an offering that um, if they have a certain type of older vehicle. Great. Um, the next category of results um, and, and probably the focus here um, was around uh, interest among this population on incentives for clean vehicles. Um, the headline here is that offering rebates had a much larger impact on um, uptake or um, reported purchase propensity than guaranteed financing alternatives or, or lower interest loans than perhaps these um, households would be able to get on the open market. Um, and essentially, uh, rebates at different sizes, uh, the higher the rebate, the uh, well, rebates of different sizes, essentially, that are, are similar to existing incentive programs, um, the higher the rebate, 
the more likely it was that these households were um, going to express a preference for um, advanced clean vehicles. Uh, I'll go into the details of you know, what levels and what types of vehicles. Further slides. Uh, but you see very substantial, for instance, up to 60 to 80 percent higher propensity to, to indicate a, a, a willingness to purchase um, this type of vehicle if an incentive level of $9,500 was offered. Um, so we conclude um, from this in some related analysis that further investment in clean vehicle purchase, purchases for this population, low and moderate income households, would be cost effective. Um, at the same time, there's, there's clearly some way to go in terms of making um, this population aware of existing incentives because less than 40% said they were aware of um, existing uh, purchase incentives for uh, PEVs. Finally, in terms of the summary, uh, we did look at a number of barriers to uh, transportation access as well as alternative modes. Um, we found that there were still a, a, number, of burials, a number of barriers existing um, for this population, both for vehicle access and for alternative modes. Um, and we particularly found in relation to potential incentive programs um, that lower income households uh, had a greater dependence on used vehicles and a lower reliance on traditional financing mechanisms. They're more likely to pay in cash, essentially, for vehicles and to go to non-traditional um, sort of uh, sellers of vehicles um, than higher income households in the survey and higher income households um, in the broader population. Um, last but not least, we found, which we found in similar research, that there appears to be remaining barriers to electric vehicle charging, essentially uh, with a lot of lower income households in California uh, not being able to uh, buy a home or live in a single family home. There's continued barriers to electric vehicle charging in apartments or multi-unit dwellings um, that have to be overcome. That brings me to the detailed results. Um, and a lot here, and I'm going to try to give you the high level, but again, uh, happy to try to answer questions as we go. The first thing we focused on, again, was the past vehicle purchase process. We actually asked about virtually everything we could think of uh, on this topic, um, including where they bought the vehicle, who made the decision when they bought the vehicle, how long it took to find the vehicle once they'd begun the search, um, how much they paid, of course, where they bought, the, I think I already said where they bought the vehicle, You'll see. Um, but the first result, uh, or the first thing we want to highlight, is um, how long it took once they'd begun searching for a vehicle um, to actually obtain the vehicle. Um, and just want to note, essentially, that it appears to be within the sample um, sort of a, a bimodal distribution where the lowest income households, those earning less than $25,000, um, and the highest income households in the sample those earning um, essentially between $75,000 and $100,000 spent more time searching for vehicles than the low to moderate income population. Um, and we think this is, although we don't know the exact reason, we think this is for two different reasons. The lowest income households likely due to constraint around um, the amount of money, disposable income they had to purchase a vehicle, um, whereas higher income households probably spent more time searching due to preference. Um, we also found some interesting results in terms of, which are not shown here, in terms of who makes the decision on a vehicle with males expressing much greater propensity to at least think that they were the primary decision maker in the vehicle purchase, um, which we're exploring further. In terms of where households bought vehicles in the past, uh, well, we actually compared both where they bought their last vehicle um, to where they said they expected to, to purchase their next vehicle. Um, and the results are largely similar in that uh, around 60% um, bought their last, their quote unquote main vehicle um, from a formal seller um, in the past and around two thirds or 70% said they were likely to in the future. People expressed um, slightly lower uh, propensity or, or at least intent to buy uh, a vehicle from someone in their social network, friend, family. Um, as well as from a, a, a semi-formal seller, um, they expected to purchase uh, um, more commonly from formal sellers in the future. Again, we don't know if that's what actually will happen in the future, but they at least express the intent um, to do so, which again um, makes it easier to uh, able them to get an incentive eventually for. 
Um, in terms of uh, what types of vehicles they bought, uh, we have you know, the exact make and model, um, and so we have a lot more results on, on that in the report. Um, but we also, of course, broke down uh, whether they bought newer used vehicles, and overall, around 40% for their last vehicle purchase indicated that they bought uh, a new vehicle, which we were actually somewhat surprised that the number was so high. Um, but you do see a trend, um, actually somewhat of a bimodal trend again, um, but particularly among the lowest income households, around 70% were buying their vehicle used, uh, whereas um, a, a higher percent were buying new vehicles in the categories, and then a lower percent, um, again, um, highest income category in the sample. In terms of the price of purchase, I mean, I think these results Striking, just in, in terms of the amount of money that low-income households are spending, again, as a percentage of their income on a vehicle. So the, the middle category, the middle reported that they spend on the vehicle, and this is what that represents in terms of their reported um, income. Uh, we see essentially what you'd expect to see, but again, I think the actual numbers are, are striking, um, that uh, Households under, who reported having an income under $25,000 spent over 100% of their income on their last vehicle purchase, but around $10,000, whereas households um, earning more than $75,000 spent more in um, absolute terms, around $18,000 for their last vehicle, um, but that represents um, only 22% of their income. But 22% of their income is still a very, very large uh, percentage. In terms of method of payment for the last vehicle, um, uh, I think it's pretty explanatory, um, but around 40% or exactly 40% um, paid for their last vehicle wholly in cash, um, whereas 54% either got a loan to finance all of their vehicle purchase or a loan to finance part of it. Um, of course, it was much more likely that households were going to pay in cash um, for used vehicles than new vehicles. in more detail in the report. Uh, that brings me to the next section, which is essentially looking at the effect of incentives, rebates, and um, guaranteed loans on uh, purchase decisions. Uh, the results I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the results of the vehicle choice experiments. Um, and I didn't, we didn't include a slide showing you what the vehicle choice experiment looks like, unfortunately. Um, should have done that, but essentially respondents were given, uh, were shown a series of choices between vehicles, uh, a mix of both um, uh, ICE vehicles, um, gasoline powered vehicles, and um, advanced clean vehicles um, at different prices with different attributes, you know, including here of the vehicle, the mileage of the vehicle, um, with different incentive levels either rebates or loans, and we're asked to choose between vehicles in a series of dynamic um, choice sets, I believe five different choice sets, um, and then uh, where they choose their first and second preferred vehicle, and then they choose among their preferred vehicles at the end, which allow us to um, elicit their preferences, um, again, self-reported preferences, uh, for different, in, different types of vehicles with different incentives that you'll see here. Um, but essentially, what this allows us to do um, is to identify, you should be looking at the, the top left um, graph here, uh, identify uh, when an incentive is offered, uh, the marginal increase in the consumer's probability, uh, when they receive a rebate or um, a guaranteed loan. So A is basically their existing preference, and B is marginal effect of an incentive uh, that would move them toward an advanced clean vehicle purchase. And again, the, the goal here is um, to understand how uh, either rebates or guaranteed loans would uh, induce a, a, a purchase uh, of a clean vehicle that otherwise would not have happened. We're not trying to offer incentives to uh, people so much who would already buy this vehicle without an incentive. We're trying to induce or uh, elicit additional purchases. Um, with incentive programs. 
Results, um, the summary of the results, uh, we're first gonna talk about essentially uh, the results of the, the, the impact of offering rebates alone. Um, then we're gonna talk about the impact of uh, offering different uh, uh, guaranteed interest rates and then the combined effect. Again, the headline finding was that rebates have a higher impact on um, preference for clean vehicles than uh, guaranteed loans, but we'll show you the details here. Um, but essentially what we found is that uh, if you offered a 20%, uh, well, sorry, if you offered a $2,500 rebate, that increased the purchase uh, propensity of advanced clean vehicles around 20%, whereas a $5,000 rebate uh, increased the propensity to purchase a vehicle around uh, 40%, and the $9,500 uh, incentive level uh, increased the propensity around 60 to 80%. Uh, there were differences between the moderate income population and the low income population, and the below 225 and above 225 is indicating below 225% of the federal poverty level and above 225% of the federal poverty level. So the low income would be below 225. Um, but essentially, uh, moderate income consumers uh, were more interested when offered rebates than purchasing a uh, PhD. Those low income consumers were more interested or expressed a greater preference or willingness to purchase a vehicle, uh, a battery electric vehicle or a hybrid electric vehicle. Um, in term, and then these are the results of uh, essentially uh, the propensity, the, the marginal propensity um, that uh, respondents indicated when they were offered guaranteed financing or uh, locked in interest rates of 15%, 7.5% or 5% as opposed to no offering of a guaranteed loan. Um, the propensity to purchase an advanced clean vehicle did increase um, uh, for hybrids and for uh, PHEVs at all income levels, but the results were very small compared to what we see with rebates. Um, and the, the financing alternatives uh, only increased the propensity to purchase a BEV slightly just for the moderate income population. And I think part of this seems to be at least related, as you'll see later, to the actual interest rates that um, uh, households reported getting on their last vehicle um, currently, were, which were actually lower than we expected, at least. This shows you, finally, um, the combined effect of if, if respondents are offered both a 15% interest rate and a rebate at different levels. We, we did this for all the interest rates, but Paying you the results here. Um, but essentially what we see is that uh, on top of the rebate effect, which as we said is, is quite substantial um, at the different rebate levels, adding on a guaranteed 15% interest rate um, increases propensity a little bit at low rebate label levels, but essentially has no effect at higher rebate levels. So the additive effect of guaranteed loans on top of rebates appears to be small. That brings us to uh, vehicle holdings for uh, this population. Um, and again, we're gonna talk about uh, a few different things here. Um, but I, I mentioned this at the beginning. Again, sort of one of the headlines of this research is essentially that um, low and moderate income households have a lot of vehicles. Um, the average is two. Again, the average, I believe, general population in California is something like 2.1. So very similar. Um, there were only, I believe, 36 households in, uh, in the sample who indicated they currently had zero vehicles. Um, at the same time, you do see quite a large um, trend for, which is backed up by all existing studies, um, for higher income population or households in the sample that own more vehicles than low income, lowest income population. So you can see here, um, households who had incomes above 75,000 held about 3.1 vehicles, whereas households um, under 25,000 had 1.4. But again, almost every household had at least one vehicle. Um, this slide shows too much information, but um, just to give you a sense of, again, all the, the data that we collected, 
Um, we did collect more information about vehicles beyond new and used and purchase price, um, including the fleet age. Again, we have the make and model, uh, fleet mileage, and MPG. But this is showing you essentially uh, the breakdown of uh, vehicle holdings, fleet age, fleet mileage, and MPG across um, six regions of, of California, the, the five major metropolitan areas of California, as well as um, sort of an other, which mostly represents rural population. Generally, there's not a lot of variation here, um, particularly in terms of vehicle holdings, number of vehicles that a household has. Um, in terms of MPG, things are um, virtually identical. There are some differences uh, between uh, regions in terms of fleet age and fleet mileage, with particularly the San Joaquin Valley having a slightly older fleet with um, higher mileage than other regions. I should have said up front that um, part of what we were asked to do with, with this research is essentially look at all of these different questions on vehicle holdings, on um, purchase decisions, on alternative travel modes, um, across income groups, across racial and ethnic uh, groups, um, across language differences, and across different areas of California. So you're seeing the results. Um, we basically ran descriptive statistics on each of the outcomes we had in the study across all those dimensions, and you're seeing different representations of that here, which were most interesting. Um, in terms of barriers to access and alternative travel modes, um, we did we, a large portion of the survey really focused on this component. Um, again, as this is a focus of um, CARB's work and the state's work more broadly. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is essentially the reported expenditure for, for fuel insurance and then aggregate expenditure that households indicated to maintain, um, operate their existing vehicle. The results here are actually just for their main vehicle. So again, the average household held two vehicles. Um, we don't know, we just, we weren't able to have the time to ask them um, every attribute and everything about all of their vehicles. Um, so this is actually showing you the results for one vehicle. Um, so just keep that in mind as you see the results on expenditures um, as we go. Uh, they're, they're actually going to be larger for the household than is reported here. This is just for essentially the main vehicle. The, what this is showing you is the um, average level of fuel expenditures um, and vehicle miles traveled, which is what BMT means, uh, across different um, geographic um, sort of thresholds, urban, suburban, and rural households measured by population density. Uh, what we see here is, I think, not very surprising to those of you who study travel behavior, essentially that urban households, um, well, except that urban households are very distinct here um, in terms of how much they spend on fuel, how much they drive per week, um, as opposed to suburban and rural households, which appear um, pretty identical, um, with urban households spending less, driving less, although the fuel economy um, between these groups. In terms of insurance expenditures, uh, and I should say the average um, fuel expenditure uh, for the given household was around. Uh, in terms of insurance expenditures, there were more distinct um, sort of, uh, results, particularly among racial and ethnic groups. And this is actually something that you see um, in past studies uh, that focus on this topic. Uh, essentially, you see that non-Hispanic white respondents uh, paid about 20% less than all other racial and ethnic minority groups combined. Um, and particularly that non, as a percentage of their income, non-Hispanic blacks paid um, a vastly higher percentage than others, um, which in past studies has largely been chalked up to discriminatory practices, although we don't have information about that here. Um, the average expenditure um, for insurance was actually higher than fuel among this population, $1,300. Um, we did also ask questions about uh, awareness and uptake uh, among these households uh, of the California Department of Insurance's low-cost insurance program, and we found that about 25% of the households in this population were aware of the program, and I think 20% among those who were aware um, were actually enrolled in the program, so 5% of the total sample. And they did have slightly lower um, 
overall insurance expenditures than this population, but not terribly notable. Uh, when we combine the aggregate expenditure, again, this is just for the main vehicle. Um, we did our best, I should say, to combine the aggregate expenditure um, to sort of get a total expenditure of ownership or what generally people call total cost of ownership um, for the vehicle. Um, our work is just combining the what you've already seen, the insurance cost, reported insurance expenditure, reported insur uh, fuel expenditure, and then if they reported that they needed a repair um, of their vehicle in the last year, the reported repair expenditure, what's not included here um, is anything about how much, if they bought a vehicle in uh, the last year, anything about purchase or payment for that vehicle, anything about registration fees or parking expenditures. This is a fairly conservative um, calculation of their actual expenditure. Um, but what you see uh, among the households for whom we were able to get um, responses for, for each of these three categories is that uh, households reported spending about 16% of, again, their annual reported income in aggregate, just on these three main categories for their main vehicle, with uh, households under 25% or under $25,000 spending over a third of their income just to maintain um, their main vehicle. Again, these households, the lowest income households, were spending less um, than other income groups, but as a percentage of their income, uh, we're spending uh, much, much more. So expenditure burden, essentially, for households uh, decreased as income. Uh, moving on to alternative modes, and uh, we actually asked a number of questions about uh, vehicle repair and um, what uh, households what households needed uh, repaired on their vehicle and how much they spent on repairs. Some of that data didn't pan out because uh, people didn't know essentially the itemized cost of replacing one part of their vehicle versus another and or, and or they just didn't respond. Um, but we did get some responses and we did, um, uh, yeah, have, we do have some results on what they did, how they traveled, if they traveled, when their main vehicle was under repair and unavailable to them because uh, it was not operable. Essentially here we find uh, that two-thirds of people reported that when their, again, their main vehicle was not available to them, they still used a personal vehicle uh, to get to work. And we asked them about their commute, how they got to work if their vehicle was being repaired. 40% um, said they just used another uh, car in their household, whereas 24% um, said they borrowed a vehicle or took ride sharing. Um, interestingly, though, uh, about 16% said they didn't go to work at all which may uh, indicate uh, a pure constraint around their travel, um, although we don't know the exact reason. Not going to work at this time. In terms of uh, sort of financial barriers, obviously there's a lot uh, that we've already shown in terms of just the expenditure burden for both purchase of vehicles and operating vehicles. But we also asked um, more detailed questions about um, sort of credit availability and the terms that households were able to get on past vehicle purchases. Uh, we weren't able to actually get their credit score because of sensitivity around asking for credit scores. Um, but we did ask people to self-rate um, their credit and we found essentially that people who um, self-rated their credit as fair or poor also reported a higher interest rate for um, their last vehicle purchase if they purchased a vehicle by getting a loan. So the average, uh, again, the average interest rate for this population that indicated getting a loan for their vehicle was 6.8%, so fairly low con con compared to what we were expecting. But those who indicated that their uh, credit rating was fair or poor was more like 9 to 10%. Um, we also found essentially that interest rates were higher, um, which the bottom table is showing you. Interest rates were higher. Uh, when people took out loans uh, to cover the full purchase cost of their main vehicle, which is, I think, intuitive. Uh, but interestingly, we also found that uh, the lowest income households um, got the lowest self-reported interest rates, uh, probably because they were taking out smaller loans. Uh, but you actually see um, you know, higher interest rates uh, for vehicle purchase in higher income categories as opposed to the four point. Lowest income 
Again, the lowest income households were more likely to buy a used vehicle um, to pay in cash. So, and when they purchased a vehicle through a loan to take out a small loan. So that is probably... Um, in terms of access to alternative modes and interest in alternative modes, we asked a number of questions. Um, the first about, um, and this is again, just asking the respondent um, about walkable access to a transit stop. We asked about both whether there was a walkable transit stop near their home and near their workplace. Um, and we found essentially that, uh, again, I think here not surprisingly, that um, respondents were much more likely to indicate that a transit stop was walkable near their home if they were in an urban area, uh, less so if they were a suburban area, and much less so if they were in a rural area. Um, but I think the most striking result is that uh, across all the categories, um, access, perceived access to a walkable transit stop was very, very low, below 15% near their workplace. So the combined accessibility of transit uh, for both home and workplace was 8%. Um, people didn't perceive that uh, transit was very accessible to them in the population, even in urban areas. In terms of actual use of alternative modes, or just modes in general, um, we asked about, about basically how often people took a number of modes that you see here on a daily, weekly, uh, yearly basis. And these are the results. It's a little hard to digest. But I think the headline here is that 70% um, of, of people indicated that they took, uh, they used a vehicle in their household on a daily basis. 20% um, indicated they walked. 5% indicated they biked, 6% indi indicated they took public transit, all the other modes, very low uh, usage levels um, on a daily basis. On a you know, weekly or yearly basis, you do see some uptake in some of the categories, including uh, public transit being 20% on a yearly basis, um, ride share and, and rental car. But again, uh, above, uh, more than half the sample indicated that they never rode um, public transit um, Oh, ever, ever, but not on a yearly basis. So low uh, sort of common dependence on transit among the public. We also asked um, if people would be willing um, to basically scrap their vehicle, trade in their vehicle if transit were made as um, inexpensive and um, convenient as owning their vehicle. Um, and around 60% said, even if you made transit as inexpensive um, and convenient as my uh, as using my vehicle, I would keep my vehicle. Uh, whereas 40% said they would seriously consider selling their vehicle. Um, again, you know, we just we asked a few questions about this. We didn't dig into it um, with a complicated choice set, um, but we do find that among the 60% who said they would keep their vehicle regardless, um, that there are a number of explanations for why people would want to keep their vehicle. That uh, don't correlate so much to travel as much as the other benefits that owning a vehicle, um, retaining a vehicle can have for the household, um, including for the lowest income population, um, ownership as an investment and cars being essentially the, the most valuable, the most durable asset that many of these households can afford. Um, but we also saw some more uh, discouraging results, I, I would say, in terms of the higher income population where the, the greatest reason given for why they want to keep their cars they enjoy driving. Um, but there, I mean, these other explanations or these other sort of preference uh, responses are, are, are derived from uh, a literature on why low-income households in some cases retain durable assets that actually cost them more um, to maintain than they necessarily get in terms of economic value, um, including, again, ownership of the car being an investment, being a safety net or some sort of insurance, or also being a social signaling, um, or having a social signaling or status effect among family and friends. Um, so we're going to dig in more into these results um, in the near future. Um, a little more encouragingly, though, uh, we did find that around 40% of households said that they would uh, participate in a vehicle scrapping program um, if. Uh, for, for $1,500 or less, which is the current amount from the state level scrapping programs. Um, didn't ask, essentially, whether they would replace 
their scrap vehicle with a new vehicle or rely um, on, on transit in, in relation to the last questions, but it seems given um, the results um, around the previous questions that they would be likely to replace their vehicles in this context, not simply scrap them. That brings us to the last category of, of results, uh, which was really around um, you know, if, if households are um, able to obtain a clean vehicle, uh, interested in obtaining a clean vehicle, how well are they equipped, um, given their travel patterns and given their existing sort of residential setting or, or se setting of their dwelling um, to uh, use a clean vehicle, uh, particularly an electric vehicle, um, and charging infrastructure um, at their household to meet their travel needs. So again, we asked um, a number of questions, uh, I should say just a few questions around simple awareness of the existing incentives for PEV purchase among this population. And this is showing you the results. Uh, this, how, how many, the percentage of people who said they were aware of state level PEV incentives um, across metropolitan areas. The general level of awareness was below 40%, although we do see higher um, notably higher, although the sample size is small, uh, notably higher um, awareness in Sacramento as opposed to other uh, metropolitan areas. We also see slightly higher um, awareness of incentives among the higher income population, those who earn $75,000, um, as opposed to the lowest income population, um, awareness of these incentives currently. Um, this slide is mislabeled. This is around uh, a high, high occupancy vehicle or carpool lane awareness, um, which is also important to uh, when, when people have PEVs, they can use carpool lanes uh, prefer preferentially without necessarily having um, the otherwise required number of people in the vehicle. Um, but essentially, we, we did find that there is um, higher uh, carpool lane awareness among uh, African-American population in, uh, in our sample. Um, they report nearly double the level of awareness uh, of approximate HOV lane they could use on their daily commute um, as opposed to white respondents. Um, this, and this is a positive, um, except so much as this is likely due to um, African-American populations uh, living closer to freeways, which is a negative. Um, but in, in this context, um, you know, uh, there, is, there are differences among racial and ethnic groups around whether they think they could access an HOV lane and use it if they had a PUV uh, preferentially. And of course, uh, another concern um, around uh, PUV use is, is around long distance trips and charging, um, necessary charging for long distance trips. We asked a number of questions around, you know, how. Uh, length of trips they typically take and whether they take long distance trips. Generally, we found that the population, this population um, is not routinely taking trips over 100 miles, um, the, the uh, basis at least. Um, the average was around 7%. Um, so the, the feasibility of PV ownership um, and the electric range of existing PV supports sort of the routine travel um, for almost nearly the entire population. Um, and then last but not least, we found uh, among or across dwelling types, we asked around the presence, we asked about the presence of an electrical outlet within uh, both 25 feet and 100 feet, uh, although uh, 25 feet is more relevant. Uh, the presence of an electrical outlet near where they park their car um, across housing type. Um, and we found results similar to results we've, we and others have found in the past. Essentially that uh, people who live in single family detached dwellings are much more likely to have approximate or nearby electric outlet than those who live in multi-unit dwellings or apartments. There continue to be barriers to access to PEV charging uh, or you know, electrical outlets, but thus PEV charging um, for those who live in apartments. We did find actually uh, uh, those living in mobile homes and other types of dwellings have higher prevalence of uh, nearby electrical outlets that facilitate charging. Um, so that would be a positive. Uh, really quickly, review the results. Um, again, the headline, one of the headlines uh, of this 
research was simply that low and moderate income households, uh, again, we got a representative sample of, of low and moderate income households for the California population of similar vehicle holdings and travel preferences to higher income households. Uh, we also found a number of barriers to um, the preferred transportation access and travel patterns of these households. Um, but at the same time, we found that incentives, uh, especially rebates, um, can uh, or, or respondents indicated that those would induce um, or facilitate more clean vehicle purchases and overcome some of these barriers um, as people look to turn over um, or replace their vehicles. Uh, one slide on future research topics that we're interested in and think are, are sort of naturally coming out of this research. Um, the first is, is more research on uh, the sort of perceived reliability and cost of operating um, particularly used PHEVs and battery life um, and, and charging. Um, I, of course, uh, we think that this research informs um, adjustments or, or it informs incentive levels um, for PEVs and can help to optimize those incentive levels and, and again, think about where the, the marginal dollar um, can best induce PEV purchase, particularly for low and mo moderate income populations. Um, we also, although we didn't talk much about it, um, in this presentation we have a uh, more detailed classification of sort of the vehicle fleet packages that these households have. If they have more than one vehicle, do they have, you know, just a compact, two compact vehicles, a compact midsize, compact large, um, and the different ways that they package together vehicles to meet their travel needs. Um, interested in exploring um, those dynamics across uh, different income levels. Uh, of course, as I highlighted in the last slide, um, we need more solutions um, to overcoming uh, the barriers to PEV charging, charging infrastructure um, for low and moderate income households, particularly as the housing affordability crisis um, continues to persist and, and low and moderate income populations um, are, are more likely to live in uh, multi-unit dwellings. And then finally, uh, interested in exploring uh, more uh, the different factors that lead to new vehicle uh, purchase among this population, particularly as we found a surprising number of respondents indicated that they actually bought a new vehicle um, compared to what uh, we expected, but also understanding um, the different sources of vehicle purchase or um, how uh, different incentive levels offered it um, through different means of purchasing a vehicle can affect uptake of uh, advanced clean vehicles. With that, I am done and uh, happy to take questions. Hi, I was curious about whether or not you tried to correlate the PEV charging uh, potential against the vehicle choice. To, I thought that might explain the, the high incidence of HEV selection is that those folks knew that they didn't have the ability to charge at home. Right. Um, I mean, we've begun to do some additional work on that, but I, uh, I think largely wasn't a high correlation because people didn't necessarily um, know about the, the necessary charging length and whatnot. Um, but we, I don't have a firm answer on whether that corresponds in our population, but I don't think that was a huge factor as far as we found. Did you try to ascertain why the HEV was so much greater than the two plug-in varieties? Yeah, I mean, we're continuing to work on exploring those different. Yeah, I was wondering uh, what other vehicle attributes you considered in your choice experiment, and were any of the marginal effects on those of interesting to you, or do you like to Right. So again, it would have been uh, in terms of the vehicle choice experiment, uh, the attributes were, of course, the, the vehicle. Uh, model, the year, the mileage, the price, um, and then production of either, uh, well, the mileage, the price, the fuel, 
economy, which was shown to respondents. Um, and then the, either the introduction of uh, rebates or uh, guaranteed interest. After, after controlling for those variables, like what do you think mostly drives the difference between the, you know, energy type of the vehicle if you have BEV? Um, Not sure I understand that. So you're c controlling for lots of these uh, variables, range, uh, fuel economy, size, all, th all these other uh, variables, and then the main uh, difference you're looking at is the type of vehicle, PHEV, BEV, right? So just wondering what you think is driving those differences after controlling for all these attributes. Yeah, I'm actually going to have to defer. Uh, JR, who's not here, is the one who ran uh, those results, so I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Actually, I have several questions. Uh, first, um, you say vehicles. We're talking specifically about passenger cars, correct? Yes. Does that include uh, light duty trucks and such, or like uh, just Ford? Yeah, all light duty vehicles. Not say motorcycles. Um, no. My uh, section's interested in whether uh, some of this information might uh, help inform uh, our efforts with motorcycles. Uh, my second question is on the um, uh, when you're uh, discussing uh, uh, travel. Uh, travel. Did you break that down by type of travel at all, in terms of you know whether uh, uh, people we consider, as, for instance, scrapping their vehicle. Uh, um, based on their travel needs, um, I can I can see why someone might uh, you know be more interested in taking uh, you know public transit to work versus going to Costco. Say, was there any uh, attempt to drill down to that level in terms of uh, you know people's perspective on whether they needed to keep people and on whether uh, other whether electric vehicles or uh, other alternatives would meet their needs? Yeah, I mean we did ask about different trip purposes, although we focused on the commute, which is. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember the results we had on. Different, and the question is around scrappage uh, for different travel patterns. Um, with more complex patterns, potentially um, being less likely to purchase a or being interested in electric vehicle potentially. Is that the question? I'm wondering uh, if there's any information on what results you would get if you asked uh, people, would you consider leaving your vehicle at home and taking transit to work if transit were more convenient versus would you consider getting rid of your vehicle entirely if transit were more convenient? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why we asked the questions about transit near workplace and home, and we found uh, very low levels of at least perceived that near the workplace. So I'm not sure there would be a huge difference there between what we found. Last question was, um, did you uh, uh, separate out uh, people who are using their vehicles for work, you know, if they drive for Lyft or uh, if they have, uh, if they do handyman type work versus people who are just using it to get to their workplace? No. Like that might be uh, part of it too? Right. That's a good point. I do remember there was a question about um, in the survey about if you drive to multiple work sites in the day, so they may be able to get at some of that in future work. Uh, hi, I'm curious. Uh, slide on annual expenditure to operate a vehicle. Why uh, there's such a sharp peak uh, for the 50 to 75k uh, cohort income cohort? Talking about this up slide. Yep. The sharp 4211. Higher for this for this particular group than any other group. Yeah, I mean we see this result across a number of different um, uh, for different outcomes where you have uh, the either the 25 to 50 or the 50 to 75k uh, spending more on uh, the people or. or um, spending more on the purchase of a vehicle, for instance. Uh, I mean, we think that's related to the type of vehicle 
they purchased and the cost of maintaining a vehicle. Although, again, we're still um, working with the, the complex classification we made of vehicle types to elicit a what exactly. But it seems to be related to the higher cost of operating the vehicles that that particular subpopulation purchased. Not include the cost of paying for the vehicle. This doesn't cost. Uh, no, this include. is just the cost of operating. Right, not car payments. Right. So it's the cost of, I mean, this is the cost of insurance, fuel, and repair. Could this be explained by these households have more people in the household and more vehicles? Uh, this is just the, the cost of maintaining their, their main vehicle. So this is for one vehicle. I mean, it might, if anything, it would be, be explained by using that vehicle more and or that vehicle being less reliable than uh, for other populations. But I don't think it would be explained by having more vehicles. Hi, uh, Jonathan Chang is with the Center for Sustainable Energy. Really appreciate the presentation, walking through it, some very interesting results. Uh, was the scope really focused on just asking purchase, or was there any questions about uh, lease options, or was that outside the scope of the survey design? Uh, we were really focused on purchase. Um, I'm trying to remember if we had any questions on lease now. We didn't. We considered it, but um, I think, well, I mean, part of what reason we didn't include it was based on the structured interviews we did, low levels of interest in lease. Thank you. Population. Hi, this is Bill Dean with Cali PA. And I slide you up there on the under $25,000, it says they spend about $2,500 on that vehicle, but it says it's 35% of their income. And that kind of blows my mind uh, that that percentage is so high. I mean, are these guys renters, homeowners, or don't they have anything else to do with their money? What little they have? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, uh, the income levels of the surveyed population are, I, was, I mean, we were, again, we were targeting basically a split between 225% of the federal poverty level, which for, or that's roughly uh, up to $55,000, and then 300% you'd be up to 72. But the respondents uh, were remarkably low income, and, and some respondents reported remarkably low incomes. So the average um, income among the 25,000, uh, uh, under $25,000 population is something like thousand dollars so we don't know exactly what's going on there self-reported income so we take them at their word um, whether there's a lot of debt financing or whether there's um, formal types of income those could be explaining how they high levels of expenditure but yeah, I, I agree in so much as that the levels of income and the reported expenditures are remarkable So I have a question about what we mean by rebate because CVRP for the most part is a post-purchase rebate, but they also have a pre-qualification function which effectively operates as a point of sale. And my question is, if there were a point of sale rebate instead, do you think that the formal seller percentage would be higher? Um. I think, I mean, people in the choice sets, they were shown a discounted price. We didn't get into the, the nuances of point of sale versus rebate because the complexity of the information was. Um, so I, I think the way it was presented was, was actually um, as, a, as an upfront point of sale rebate. So. Um, we didn't elicit whether if they were going to get paid back uh, or the difference between point of sale versus later. Uh, 
We have a question from the internet. Um, it says, did you explore how making the vehicle market more transparent, that is in terms of the total cost of ownership, might deliver more cost-effective results than monetary incentives? In other works allowing people to choose vehicles based on total cost of ownership. What was the question? If you explored uh, making the vehicle market more transparent, so like if, I guess, informing the survey recipient, uh, the survey uh, respondents about total cost of ownership, uh, if you think that would have changed the results, this is my interpretation of the question. Right. So whether reminding people how much they're spending on their vehicle would have changed. And compared to the new cleaner vehicles, I guess. Um, I mean, we didn't explicitly do that, um, although the, the, the questions about cost of ownership were all, and we added up the cost of ownership for respondents um, before we talked to them about cleaning vehicle purchase. But um, again, we did ask respondents, um, and, and some of them indicated that even, even, if, we, even if we told them um, alternatives can be used cheap and so some of them said, well, I just don't believe that's possible. Um, and I think there's still, uh, I mean, I think informing people about the total cost of ownership can uh, purchase decisions or, or travel decisions, but there is some sort of durable desire for a vehicle that goes beyond even uh, expenditures or travel needs that I think needs to be taken into consideration. Hi. Thank you for coming today to talk to us about this. It's been really interesting. Um, I was wondering, did you take any information um, on the age demographics of respondents in your study? Yeah, we asked their, their age. I mean, again, this is a, we asked a single respondent in the household, but then we're reporting the household. I believe the average age was, uh, for the respondent was, I believe it was around 42, and it wasn't too dissimilar from the average age of the California population. But I don't think that really means much. We didn't we didn't really look at whether the age of the respondent affected any of these. Items. Okay, I just know in some of the studies that I've been looking at that you know um, people in different age brackets are more or less conducive. To, or open to buying advanced technologies, and that um, given this was an online survey, whether that might have been uh, representative of a full age bracket, or whether our elderly people would have not wanted to do an online survey, or that would be less uh, buying advanced technology. It just was kind of interesting on. That's a good point, and we can look into that further. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was wondering is, did you look at um, kind of the average household size of the respondents? Certainly, did yes. So we also, I mean, uh, we looked at, well, we looked at that. Well, do you have an initial question? Well, I was just wondering if that actually, um, if you are, you know, if, uh, family with three children versus a, a couple that with no children, whether whether that was a driver maybe in the decision making. Right. So uh, certainly it was a driver in the decision making around households with more people and particularly with more um, adults and particularly with more licensed drivers were more likely to own more vehicles. Across income groups, although income was still a large size, uh, we have results on particularly looking at vehicle holdings um, across household size and number of licensed drivers in the report. But um, we didn't look so much at other decisions um, or preferences by household size, although we have the data to do so. Yeah, just curious given, you know, I think it's starting, the market's starting to change, but that, you know, um, passenger capacity and cargo capacity have been pretty desirable. Um, 
characteristics and right so that's what we've also we, we did some classification manual classification of, sort of body type and fleet packages among multi-person households there's no real convention for doing that that we're aware of so we're still trying to sort out how we should be looking at fleet packages and how that relates to um, vehicle preferences and travel needs in a more concrete way but we have the data to do that um, in future work interesting thank you on a related note i'm wondering if you looked at whether um, uh, how many of the adults in a household were actually working because I, I would think uh, families with uh, uh, income above 75,000 might be a little more likely to have one of the parents staying home with the kids and that might explain some of this effect with the uh, operating costs. Yeah, I don't believe we asked about employment for anyone beyond the respondent. Um, but uh, certainly household, household structure and household career choices would, would affect travel patterns um, and potentially the need or Can you comment on the likelihood of low-income purchasers to choose to buy a plug-in vehicle based on new or used? And, and I guess would, from your results, would they be more likely to purchase used plug-in vehicles versus new? Yeah, so we did, uh, I should have, we asked uh, the choice that's included both new and used uh, advanced clean vehicles. Uh, the preference generally was, I believe, for, for used vehicles um, among this population because the, the prices were generally lower um, when offered these various alternatives. Um, so that, does that answer your question? Hedging, because JR, who's not here, was, was prepared to present, particularly on that section. So uh, I I can certainly get you an answer, but I don't know the full details off the top. Hello. Thanks for the uh, presentation. It's very interesting. I have a question about the standard deviation. I see it varies from income. And the duration varies from uh, 935 up to 2,397. Do you have any um, outliers that you, or you just included all the numbers no, there? We did a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, cleaning of the data to remove outliers um, for, uh, I mean, particularly for expenditures, but also, I mean, just clear errors in, in some of the responses on things like vehicle age or mileage. Um, so I'm not, uh, we have details of all those cleaning procedures and where the cutoffs were made in the report. I'm not exactly sure I could say for expenditures, but certainly we looked at the, the data and made sure to remove outliers that would have skewed the distribution considerably, although we did, um, you know, we didn't remove all outliers. And there are some, I mean, there is quite a wide range of response, even the responses that we thought uh, were you have the median numbers available? Uh, we certainly could have them available. They're not in the report. Most of them are presented with the end, the mean, standard deviation. Um, we could produce those questions. Um, I'm going to read this question from the internet. Were the surveys and interviews only conducted in English or were they available in other languages, specifically in Spanish? Yeah, so there were, uh, I, I believe there was either an equal split or a 60-40 split between English and Spanish. Um, that was an explicit target of the survey was um, at least half Spanish. We also made an attempt at um, Asian language uh, survey, although we couldn't find enough, essentially the survey firm couldn't find enough respondents um, using Mandarin about a, a population that was representative. Uh, so although we made every attempt. 
I was just going to make a suggestion for future work, and that is there was a question a moment ago about new versus used uh, BEVs in particular. And there is legislation now that requires CARB to establish a, a battery warranty program, essentially for low-income folks. And I would think that that would influence their decisions as to whether or not to go with used battery electric vehicles. I think you're very correct there. Any other questions? All right, well, we appreciate very much uh, the presentation and uh, the questions and the answers. So thank you guys. Feel free to, uh, if you have any follow-up questions, reach out to me or Greg or JR and um, thanks again. Thank you.